So uh, my name is Reem Hafez. I'm a third year DFL student. And um, like Mike mentioned, I'm stepping in to give the talk that Winnie would have given on financing healthcare in China. So I hope you'll all bear with me. Um, for those of you who are unaware, so China launched an incredibly ambitious healthcare reform in 2009. And it committed to spending over 125 billion US dollars in a span of three years. So the question for China is not really how to raise more money for the healthcare sector, but rather how to um, use those funds in a, mo in a, in a, in a cost-effective way to get the most bang for your buck, basically. So before I talk about the reform, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background about um, the situation, the health, the health situation in China at the dawn of the healthcare reforms. So there was no health insurance coverage, little, little health insurance coverage. The urban insurance scheme covered less than half of the urban population in China, mostly formal sector workers, and even that didn't extend to their dependents. The cooperative medical scheme, the CMS, um, which was the backbone for free rural health care, had all but collapsed following the administrative and economic reforms of the 70s and 80s. Um, with increasing financial um, stress, the central governments, which used to play a huge role in supporting local governments to provide public um, services, uh, was no longer able to do so. And the provinces that were poor and less able to raise that revenue suffered most. So there was great regional differences in funding, which eventually translated into huge inequalities um, in health outcomes. Um, what the government did try to do to ensure uh, basic services was to set prices for basic services, basic primary health care, public services, below cost, all the while relaxing charges for drugs and high-tech treatments. So what happened? Perverse incentives. You had a shift towards away from low, low, um, low um, revenue generating basic services towards the overprescription of drugs and high-tech treatment. And so as a result, by 2000, um, out-of-pocket expenditures made up over 60% of total health expenditures. And the percentage of households incurring um, catastrophic and impoverishing medical expenditures was one of the highest in the regions. Um, just to end on this slide, there's also new health challenges that are, causing, that, are, that are causing China to think about a shift in disease management and skill set. So 80% um, of, 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 mor of mortalities in China are made up of chronic diseases. Um, you have increasing prevalence of, of diabetes, hypertension, all of which are causing uh, the need to think about shifting away from acute hospital care towards more ongoing um, uh, management of disease. So in response, um, the guiding principles of reform centered around this idea of a harmonious society in which the government would reclaim its role, reinstate its role in providing public health, uh, uh, in, in the provision of public health goods, and, and also health insurance because it considered it as a social um, security undertaking. And what's great about China is that there's actually lots of opportunities to see this succeed because this whole reform is being implemented in a highly favorable fiscal environment and with a government that's increasingly committed to investing more in the social sector. So as I mentioned, over $125 billion in a span of three years. So the question is how to ensure that this additional funding is spent in a cost-effective way that ensures quality healthcare services for all. And the questions that they're thinking about is how do you balance between demand and supply side um, interventions? So direct government provision or premium and insurance subsidies, education campaigns, all of these things to think about influencing consumer incentives and their behavior, or do you focus more on the supply side? Um, so innovations in service delivery, thinking about different ways to pay your providers, um, regulation and enforcement, creating that framework. And also, do you think about um, prioritizing your funding towards the entire population, or do you want to target vulnerable groups? So it was all of these questions um, that led the government to come up with the five pillars of reform. And I'm going to go through them one by one. Um, first, um, increasing public health spending. As we all know, where there's externalities present, the free market is not going to provide for these services. And we saw this with the economic reforms of the 80s and 90s, uh, of the 70s and 80s. Um, so they decided to provide the funds so that providers could, defi could deliver a defined um, package of public health services. So health and education promotion, planned immunization and vaccination campaigns, 
um, prevention and control of infectious diseases, but also uh, preventing and controlling uh, and, and managing chronic diseases. And as I mentioned, the regional inequalities before, um, they decided to also target their funding towards these previously ignored or underserved um, areas, the western and central regions, which have traditionally the poorer regions of China. Um, the second pillar is improving the delivery of primary health care services. So building the primary health care infrastructure, setting up community health centers in urban areas, township health centers in rural areas that would deliver the public health services we just talked about, but also act as gatekeepers um, from primary health to specialist services, from lower level village and township facilities that provide primary care to upper level county and city hospitals. Um, also, government supply size subsidies, so they would fund the infrastructure, but they also fund the basic salaries of staff. And the idea here is to remove um, this need to rely on drug sales and to shift the incentives back towards providing primary health care. Um, the other thing they're also thinking of doing under this pillar is to train, uh, targeted training to raise the quality and the appropriate appropriateness of care um, to, to, to raise the, tr the level of trust in these lower level facilities. Now expanding health insurance coverage, this is the pillar that's received the most press. Um, surprise, actually by 2011, 97% of um, the Chinese population was covered by one of these insurance schemes. But as we all know, coverage is not just about the breadth of, of coverage. It's not just about the percentage of population that's covered. So the package of services that are covered and the proportion of costs that are reimbursed. And so you have three schemes in China. As early as 1998, the Urban Employee Benefit Medical Insurance uh, Scheme covered. Uh, it was mandatory for urban employees of state-owned and private-owned um, enterprises. Later on, the Urban Resident Basic Medical Insurance Scheme was extended to those that weren't eligible under this first scheme, so to um, students, children, the elderly, the unemployed, and this was a voluntary scheme. Finally, the NCMS rounded it out and provided uh, insurance for rural areas, and this was rolled out between 2003 and 2008. Now, um, as you could probably see, there is, they're, they're quite fragmented, and the, the, there are unequal benefits. You have per capita funding that ranges quite, that is quite different between the first scheme and the other two voluntary schemes. So... Um, one of the next steps that the government is doing is, one, they're thinking about integrating the three schemes, bigger risk pools, equalizing the, the benefits, um, starting with the UR, BMI, and the NCMS scheme that are closer in, in benefits. But also, like I said, um, the government started with a very shallow benefit package, and it covered mostly inpatient services. So that's why you only see inpatient reimbursement rates down there. Um, and it's gradually moving towards ex including outpatient services, chronic diseases, priority diseases. And I just want to mention that these two voluntary schemes, a lot of people always wonder, well, how has China reached such high coverage rates with two voluntary schemes? Well, the government provides huge subsidies um, to encourage enrollment, and it actually pays the premium for children, um, the poor, and the elderly. And the, and the NCMS, the central and local governments, provide a big chunk of that premium, so households um, have to pay very little. So that's why the insurance rates are, uh, the, the coverage rates are quite high. Um, introducing a national essential medi medicine scheme. This is quite um, closely tied with the pri primary health care um, pillar. So the idea is to reduce the reliance on drug sales. Um, so, so basically, it requires all primary health care facilities to only stock and prescribe from this list. And it also, um, there's the instituted law where these primary health care facilities, they're not allowed to make profits. So they have a zero drug profit policy. So, um, and the other step of, of this pillar was to... Um, certify manufacturers who are producing the drugs, and also bring in this province-based competitive bidding to take out, um, sort of lessen the leakage as you go down the administrative levels and reduce um, counterfeit and low-quality drugs. Finally, the reform of public hospitals. Now, this is the most complicated of the five pillars. Um, public hospitals deliver 90% of the country's inpatient and outpatient services. Partly there's a lack of trust in lower level facilities and their quality, partly because there's no referral system that's actively enforced. So 
but then at the same time, government subsidies only represent 70% of their, 7% of their revenue. So to compensate, hospitals make their money, their operating money from drug sales. There's no zero drug policy that's enforced at the public hospital level. That's only for primary health care and service fees. Most of the providers, the hospitals, they still operate under a fee-for-service payment. So it's incentivizing more provision, inducing um, supplier-induced demand and all of these things. So how do you restore the public hospital's objectives to serve um, the broader public interest? And this is where it gets complicated um, because the, there is a state, the state council sets the policy, but all the provinces are free to implement this policy how they see fit. So there's lots of different pilots going on, trying to reach these objectives, but testing for different things. One of the most common one is to reduce this reliance on, on drug sales and to delink provider salary, the uh, doctor's salary from, from them selling drugs. And so some of the provinces have set up independent drug distribution networks. Some have extended the zero drug profit policy to also apply to public hospitals in their, in their counties. Um, they've also decided to increase government subsidies to provide these public, um, public health activities and social welfare activities. Um, one of the other big ones that is being piloted is provider payment methods. So there's a shift. People are shifting away from fee-for-service towards either a capitation budget, a global budget, or DRGs. Um, Finally, also separation of ownership and management. Um, so you have new agencies that are coming in to take over the purchasing functions of hospitals and to see if that helps. So, um, so how is this 125 billion um, allocated across these five pillars? So by, by between 2009 and 2011, the, the biggest chunk has been um, health insurance, but also public health and the building of this primary uh, health care infrastructure. And I'm going to focus on talking about for, on insurance for a bit. It's not surprising that insurance gets the biggest chunk. Um, there's lots of talk about universal health coverage, the big buzzword, and there's significant literature in which expanding health insurance is a dominant feature on the way to achieving universal health coverage. So I thought I'd explore this a little bit more and ask, well, how effective has health insurance, expanding health insurance, actually been at achieving the implied goals of universal health coverage, so in terms of utilization and financial risk protection? And I'm looking at NCMS. They cover 60, 62% of the population of China. And I'm not going to go through these studies one by one. I'm just going to sum it up by saying that overall, there is where there are robust quasi-experimental studies um, the evidence that it does increase utilization and access to healthcare, but the evidence on financial risk protection is a lot more mixed. So you have some studies where outpatient and patient uh, expenditure actually increase, some where there's no, uh, no, um, no impact, and some where there is a reduction, but among specific um, either income groups or populations. And so the obvious question is, why is this evidence mixed? Well, one reason is that health insurance is often treated as a simple dummy variable. And the variety in plan characteristics, so like benefit packages, reimbursement rates, um, co-payments, uh, deductibles, ceilings, all of these things are rarely taken into account. And like I said, the early NCMS plans mostly co covered inpatient only, shallow benefit packages with high deductibles, high co-payments, and low ceilings. And it's only as the NCMS has evolved that um, the government subsidy has more than tripled and allowed co-payment rates for these priority diseases to come down and um, for these diseases to come down and expand um, the benefit package. But there has been no evaluation done since 2008, so the situation could have changed. But um, another reason is that Interventions that are solely evaluated in controlled experimental settings often don't take into account the complexity of health systems. So um, there are actually there, there are a number of competing conceptual frameworks when you think about health systems. The WHO talks about it as the six building blocks. I think others talk about the, the five control, uh, control knobs, so like financing, provider payment, um, regulation, organization, and behavior. And so more recently, people have suggested that these complex interventions, like expanding health insurance, might actually have multiple system-wide effects and act on a number of these building blocks all at once. So you should consider system-wide approaches to health systems research 
that focuses on these process of changes and on the relationships between stakeholders. And why is this important? Well, so for example, the NCMS currently just reimburses hospitals for services, but it doesn't play a role in strategic purchasing. Um, it, it has no strategic purchasing role. So how can we expect NCMS to reduce out-of-pocket expenditure if there is um, little accountability for providers inducing demand, being paid on a, on a fee-for-service basis, uh, and, and there's no accountability for their over-prescribing over behavior. So they kind of go hand in hand. And one of the big debates um, in China right now is whether this money would not be more effective if it was channeled directly towards hospitals. But unfortunately, reforming public hospitals has been the slowest of the five pillars, and it's where we have the least amount of information. And um, everyone is eager, eagerly awaiting to see what's going to come out of this research. And so, I mean, it's, it's still an ongoing debate and something that we can talk about in the, in, in the discussion. So I'm just going to end it here with some few take-home messages. There's no shortage of funding in China. The question in China is not raising revenue, but how to spend it. And insurance coverage alone is not going to do it. Uh, so far, it has not reduced financial. It has not provided the kind of financial protection that, 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 that we were hoping. Um, hospital reform is key to realigning provider behavior with broader public <coughs> interest and reducing waste and efficiency. And so um, policymakers, not just in China, but in other countries undergoing reform, are all eagerly following these pilots to see what, what is going to um, yield the, the, the better results is what, what provider payment to look for, what, what kind of governance or accountability structure or management structure provides the best model. So I'm just going to end it there. Mm -hmm.